Uh, welcome to this week's edition of the EV Journal Club. Uh, my name is Zach Troyer. I'm a postdoctoral fellow in Dr. Kenneth Whitworth's lab at Johns Hopkins University. Um, today, we have the honor of welcoming Dr. Honami Naora um, from the University of Texas MD Anderson Cancer Center. Um, she's going to be telling us today about the glycoprotein CD147 that defines M, uh, microRNA enriched EVs that derive from cancer cells. So as a reminder uh, for the Journal Club, please post your questions in the chat box, and then we will allow unmuting at the end of the presentation for you to ask your question. Uh, Dr. Nora, the floor is yours. Okay. Thank you, Zach, for your kind introduction. Well, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone, wherever you are. Um, firstly, I would like to thank um, Ken for kindly inviting me and giving me this opportunity to discuss some recent studies from my lab. It's such a pleasure and honor to present to this group. And so the study I'll be discussing today uh, was published in the Journal of Extracellular Vesicles. And this work was developed and driven by an exceptionally talented young investigator in my lab, Song Yi Ko. Now, for the past 20 years, uh, my lab has primarily focused on investigating the mechanisms that drive ovarian cancer progression with a focus on the tumor microenvironment. So I'd like to begin by briefly describing what motivated this specific study and several fundamental underlying questions. Okay, so over the past 10 years, uh, we've seen an exponential increase in the number of studies that have investigated how EVs mediate intercellular communication in the tumor microenvironment. And a substantial proportion of those studies have reported that stromal cells are reprogrammed or educated to support tumor growth and metastasis through the transfer of microRNAs by cancer cell derived EVs. And this, these findings have stimulated substantial interest in utilizing EV associated microRNAs as cancer biomarkers. Now, of course, this notion of EV mediated microRNA transfer is not unique to the tumor microenvironment but has been described in a broad variety of physiological and pathological contexts. Um, and currently we have more than 25,000 microRNA entries in vesicopedia. However, uh, the, uh, at the same time, we've had several compelling studies that have shown that the majority of EVs do not contain copy numbers of microRNAs that are biologically significant. And furthermore, these studies have shown that a substantial proportion of circulating microRNA is non-vesicular, i.e. not encapsulated in EVs, but is, is, in, is instead bound to HDL, argo 2 complexes, and other nanoparticles. So how do we reconcile these apparently discordant bodies of studies? So we hypothesize that we can reconcile these two bodies of studies by hypothesizing that there might be a subpopulation of EVs that is selectively enriched in microRNA. Now, as I mentioned, there's been substantial interest in utilizing EV cargo, especially microRNAs, as cancer biomarkers. And it's a very attractive proposition but there are several challenges and layers of complexity, several challenges that need to be overcome and several uh, layers of complexity that need to be uh, better appreciated. So the first, which of course I'm sure this audience is aware, is that an individual cell type, including cancer cells, can release several subpopulations of EVs that vary in their cargo. Secondly, we know that almost all types of cells release EVs, and it's still unclear what proportion of EVs in body fluids of cancer patients actually derive from cancer cells. Another layer of complexity 
is that it's known that EVs are elevated in other pathological conditions, such as diabetes and hypertension, that are common comorbidities of cancer patients. As such, cancer cell-derived EVs might only constitute a minor fraction of EVs in body fluids of cancer patients who have comorbid conditions and or small tumors. Moreover, we have no well-defined methods that can identify cancer cell-derived EVs in body fluids. So we initiated this study very simply by reviewing the top 100 EV proteins in the Exocarta and Physicalpedia databases, of which there are 77 pro proteins in common, and these include 10 common membrane proteins shown here. Now, of these, these include, in blue, our three old friends, the tetraspanins, the five membrane proteins shown in pink, and the lower two shown in gray, we had to uh, exclude from further analysis because we just didn't have good antibodies for flow cytometry to pursue these. And we initially confirmed that the top eight cell membrane proteins were expressed in various cell lines, uh, 293 cells and several commonly used cancer cell lines. And then we evaluated the prevalence of membrane proteins on EVs that are released by these cell lines. Now, in we have provided a full and detailed description of the methods by which we isolated, validated, and characterized EVs in our study. Uh, but I'd like to just briefly mention that we've isolated EVs from conditioned media and body fluids using st several steps that include an ultrafiltration step to remove soluble proteins of less than 100 kilodalton, followed by density gradient fractionation. And we've analyzed our EV preps by uh, MTA, TEM, immunoblot, and flow cytometry. And for our flow cytometry, we have optimized our settings using microbeads of various diameters and some examples of the detection of membrane proteins on EVs um, is just shown in the lower panel. And what our analysis found was that the prevalence of EVs that express either CD147 or CD98 was almost similar to the prevalence of EVs that express either one of the three tetraspanins. And we confirmed that our EVs are containing full length forms of CD147 and CD98 and are not being contaminated by shed ectodomains of these proteins. So we next proceeded to evaluate whether CD147 positive and CD98 positive EVs represent subpopulations that are distinct from tetraspanin positive EVs. Now we had to overcome a substantial technical hurdle in evaluating more than one EV on the surface, more than one marker, because it's actually very difficult to detect more than one membrane protein on EVs using conventional, uh, by conventional staining with antibodies due to steric hindrance. So we have taken the following up, we took the following approach, which, which is to take our batch of the total EV population, and then immunocapture EVs that express a given marker, say marker A, and then take the untouched pool of EVs comprising of marker A negative EVs and stain that population for a second marker, marker B, and followed by flow cytom fly cyt cytometric analysis. And the interpretations of our results is best described in the following cartoon. So let's assume marker B is expressed on 40% of the total EV population. And if marker B and marker A are co-expressed on the same EVs, then when we deplete marker A positive EVs, we're also removing EVs that express marker B. 
So the prevalence of marker B positive EVs following depletion should be theoretically zero. Conversely, if marker A and marker B are expressed on entirely different EVs, then when we deplete marker A positive EVs, the uh, frequency or prevalence of EVs that express marker B in the residual population would be enriched, so its percentage would be higher. So we perform this approach for every combination of the five EVs of interest, but the final, the key result is shown in the lower panel on left, where we have depleted uh, the performed immunodepletion of the total EV population to re by, we're using a three, a triple depletion where we've depleted EVs that express CD63, 81, and CD9 to remove as many tetraspanin positive EVs as possible. And as you can see, uh, that in the residual population is much more enriched for EVs that express CD147 and CD98. And these results indicate that CD147 and CD98 are predominantly expressed on tetraspanin negative EVs. We then evaluated differences uh, between the EVs in each of these subpopulations in terms of their various properties, including size. Now, to evaluate differences in size, we have a stable, we have expressed each of these markers, uh, each of these membrane proteins as GFP fusion proteins, isolated, <coughs> excuse me, total EVs from the cell lines and analyzed the size of the GFP positive EVs. And as you can see by flow cytometry, the CD47 positive and CD98 positive EVs are slightly larger than the tetraspanin positive EVs. And we've confirmed these findings by evaluating the size distribution of each pop, uh, of the EVs in each subpopulation by fluorescence NTA. We then look if investigated differences in the biogenesis of these EV subpopulations. And as and what we found was that in contrast to the tetraspanins, CD147 and CD98 are predominantly expressed on the plasma membrane of cells, excuse me. So we've got cell lines with uh, inducible knockdown of various components of the escort machinery, such as HGS and TSG 101. And what we find, as expected, that when we knock down components of the escort machinery, uh, that uh, production of tetraspanin positive EVs is inhibited, whereas production of CD147 and CD98 positive EVs is not inhibited. So these findings indicate the biogenesis of CD147 and CD98 uh, positive EVs is escort independent and they're very likely not to be exosomes. So following this, we investigated differences between these EV subpopulations in terms of their microRNA content. And in order to evaluate whether these EV subpopulations uh, carry biologically active microRNAs, we generated the following assay system. We generated several donor cell lines in which we can um, induce expression of a test microRNA. In this case, we've used microRNA 302 as a test microRNA because this microRNA cluster is not expressed in mature cells, so we would have minimal background. We then generated a recipient cell line that stably expresses the MK reporter under the control of mere 
302 target sequences and the recipient cells were stimulated with EVs derived from the donor cell in which the test microRNA is induced. Now, again, we had to overcome a technical problem, which is that it's very difficult to positively select an EV subpopulation by immunocapture and then detach the EVs from the beads in intact form. So again, along the lines of what I uh, presented just before, we've taken our total EV uh, population, we've immunocaptured, uh, immunodepleted EVs that express a given marker, marker A, and then taken the untouched supernatant of marker A negative EVs and used this popular pool to stimulate the recipient cells. And we've assayed mere the microRNA activity in terms of MK fluorescence. And in the lower panel, shown in the pale blue columns, represent the pools in which we have removed EVs that express either of the three tetraspanins. And it's these pools that showed the greatest inhibition of inhibiting the reporter, indicating that these subpopulations contain the highest amount of the microRNA. And as I mentioned before, CD147 and CD98 are predominantly expressed on tetraspanin negative EVs and consistent with this result when we evaluate the copy number of the microRNA in the marker positive subpopulations, we find that we get the highest copy number of the microRNA in CD147 positive EVs, less in the CD98 positive EVs, whereas the tetraspanin positive EVs contain very little of the microRNA. We also confirmed that there are no significant differences in the uptake of EVs of each subpopulation in tetras in, in, in by recipient cells. Following this, we then evaluated the total microRNA content in each of these EV subpopulations in, equi in approximately equivalent numbers of EVs in each of the following populations. And these results show that CD147 positive EVs have contained the highest microRNA content, whereas the tetraspanin positive EVs have very contained very little microRNA. And furthermore, which was actually which was very important, we confirmed that our CD147 positive and also our 98 positive EVs are not contaminated with HDL or argo 2 complexes. And we've done this by immunoblot shown in the right-hand panel. Furthermore, we confirmed the small microRNA content in each of the EV populations using a bioanalyzer with a PICO chip. You could see here that the tetraspanin positive EVs contain almost no small microRNA. We detect a small amount of small microRNA in the 98 positive EVs, but a very definitive peak of small microRNA, of, of, of small RNA corresponding to the size of microRNAs in the CD147 positive EVs. Now, several RNA binding proteins have been shown to mediate sorting of microRNAs into EVs, and we detected one of these RNA binding proteins, HNRMP A2B1, only in CD147 positive EVs, but not in EVs that express CD98 or the tetraspanins. And by immunoprecipitation, we found that CD147 is interacting with HNRMP A2B1. Furthermore, in functional studies, uh, we isolated CD147 positive EVs from cells in which we've knocked out HNRMP A2B1 by CRISPR-Cas9, and we find that the microRNA content 
in those CD147 positive EVs is substantially diminished as compared with CD147 positive EVs derived from the parental cells. So collectively, these findings show that CD147 positive EVs are enriched in microRNA through the interaction of CD147 with HNRMP A2B1. Now, CD147 uh, is overexpressed in more than 20 types of common cancers, but it's also expressed in some types of normal cells, such as endothelial cells, leukocytes, and some types of normal epithelium, such as renal tubule epithelium. And we confirmed this overexpression of CD147 in renal cancer cells and also other cancer cell lines, which is much higher, as you can see on the right panel, as compared with a renal proximal tubal epithelial cells, the uh, cell of origin of renal cell carcinoma, and also with endothelial cells. We then evaluated the number of EVs in each of, the popu of our EV subpopulations that are released by equivalent numbers of cells, of endothelial cells, normal tubal epithelial cells, and renal cell and renal cancer cells. And you can see below that the renal cancer cells are secreting, obviously, more uh, a total numbers of EVs. But it was interesting when we evaluated the number of EVs in each subpopulation, and we found that the cancer cells are producing almost similar numbers of tetraspanin positive EVs as compared with normal cells, but the cancer cells are producing significantly higher numbers of CD147 positive EVs. So we next investigated uh, the a cell of origin of CD147 positive EVs in vivo. And to do this, we generated human tumor xenografts in nude mice, collected plasma from these mice at different time points, and then distinguished EVs in plasma. Uh, we distinguished host cell-derived EVs and cancer cell-derived EVs by using antibodies that are highly specific to mouse and human surface markers. And to evaluate tetraspanin positive EVs, we focused on CD9 positive EVs because CD9 was the most predominantly expressed tetraspanin. And uh, what we found was that as tumor volume increases, we see an increased prevalence of cancer cell derived EVs that express CD9. We also find a substantial increase in the, uh, in the prevalence of cancer cell derived EVs that express CD147. However, the CD147 cancer derived EVs were uh, the elevation was detected much earlier than the cancer cell derived EVs that express CD9. And furthermore, comparative analysis of the EVs by their cell of origin revealed that the majority of EVs that express CD9 derive from mouse host cells, whereas the majority of CD147 positive EVs are derived from the human cancer cells. And we performed this study using other tumor xenograft models uh, in our paper. We then evaluated the prevalence of these EV subpopulations in cancer patient plasma. And shown here is data from an ovarian cancer patient cohort where patients with advanced stage ovarian cancer have higher total numbers of EVs in plasma as compared with patients with early stage benign conditions or healthy volunteers. Interestingly, the prevalence of EVs that express tetraspanins was found to be not significantly different between ovarian cancer patients and women with benign gynecologic conditions or healthy volunteers. We see a very modest increase in abundance of CD98 positive EVs in the cancer patients, but the most striking difference was with the CD147 positive EVs where we see a 20-fold increase in prevalence in the cancer patients and particularly those 
with early stage disease, whereas we do not see this increased prevalence in women with benign gynecologic conditions. And this result was particularly striking when you compare with the levels of CA125, which is the most commonly used ovarian cancer marker, which is unable to distinguish between women with benign gynecologic conditions and women with early stage ovarian cancer. We furthermore performed this study uh, with using evaluating plasma from patients with renal cell carcinoma, and we obtained very similar results. No difference in the abundance of tetraspanin positive EVs in renal cell cancer patients, but the most striking difference with CD147 positive EVs, which show a substantial increase, especially for those with early stage disease. So given that CD147 positive EVs predominantly derive from cancer cells and are enriched in microRNA, we next asked whether CD147 immunocapture increases the detection of cancer-derived circulating microRNA. So we again generated human tumor xenografts in mice and then collected plasma from mice and we, we isolated um, circulating microRNA from equivalent volumes of plasma by three different methods. In the first method, we've isolated all cell-free microRNA by uh, direct lysis, i.e. just throwing trisol, in which is the most commonly used method for isolating circulating microRNA. In the second method, we have isolated microRNA following precipitation using exoquick reagent. And in the third method, we've isolated microRNA following immunocapture with CD147 antibody. Now the CD147 immunocapture method yielded the lowest amount of total microRNA. And then we next evaluated copy numbers of a cancer-derived circulating microRNA. Here we tested for MIR-1233, which is expressed in human renal cell cancer, but has no mouse ortholog. And as, we, and as you can see, we detect a substantially higher copy numbers of this microRNA in the fluid-derived microRNA sample that we have isolated by CD147 immunocapture as compared with the two conventional methods. And we were able to obtain similar results using other types of human xenograft models. We next evaluated whether circulating microRNAs that are isolated by CD147 immunocapture from cancer patients reflect the microRNA signature of the patient's tumor. So we again, uh, we isolated circulating microRNAs from equivalent amounts of body fluids of cancer patients by each of the three methods that I just described. And in each fluid derived sample, we assayed expression levels of 84 cancer associated microRNAs in each sample and then evaluated correlations between those microRNA levels with the microRNA levels in the matching tumor tissue of the same patient. And the example I'm going to show here is from an ovarian cancer patient where we obtained the highest correlation with the tumor microRNA levels with the microRNA levels that we have uh, detected in plasma where we have isolated by CD147 immunocapture. We obtain similar results. Uh, in that first case, we've isolated from ascites. The second panel shows an isolation from plasma of a different patient, and we have obtained similar results uh, in samples of, uh, in specimens from patients with renal cell carcinoma. We then asked whether isolating circulating microRNAs by CD147 immunocapture could improve the diagnostic performance of a cancer-associated microRNA. 
and we investigated MIR210 because several independent studies have shown that this microRNA is, is substantially overexpressed in renal cell carcinoma and can be detected in plasma of renal cell carcinoma patients. Now, I'm showing here uh, microRNA samples uh, where we've isolated all cell-free microRNA by direct lysis. Uh, there are substantially higher copies of this microRNA that can be detected in plasma of patients with advanced stage renal cell carcinoma, but not in patients with early stage disease. However, when we isolated the circulating microRNAs by CD147 immunocapture, we are able to detect a significant difference in copy number of this microRNA between healthy volunteers and those with early stage renal cell carcinoma. So in conclusion, uh, our study uh, identified that CD147 and CD98 define subpopulations of EVs that are distinct from tetraspanin positive EVs. Secondly, CD147 positive EVs are selectively enriched in microRNA through the interaction of CD147 with HNRMP A2B1. CD147 positive EVs predominantly derive from cancer cells and increase in prevalence in cancer patients from early stages of disease. And finally, CD147 immune capture could be an effective approach to isolate cancer-derived circulating microRNAs. I would like to acknowledge all the people uh, who, perform, who were involved in this study, and especially Song Yi Ko, who developed and drove this study. I'd like to thank our clinical collaborators, Ernst Lengel in Chicago and Eric Jonash at MD Anderson for, for providing clinical samples for this work. And of course, I'd like to thank um, you, the audience for your attention. And I would be uh, more than happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Nora, for this great talk. Um, as a reminder, if you have any questions, please um, post them in the chat. We're now we're now going to enter um, a discussion phase, so I'll I'll uh, allow everyone to um, unmute and turn on their videos. Um, but yeah, please post any questions in the chat if you have any questions for Dr. Nora. Um, and just to kind of to start off the um, the questions. I had a question about um, the analysis of your EVs. Yes. Have you, have you considered using an instrument um, like the ExoView, um, the SP iris technique that allows for um, detection of multiple proteins on the surface of an EV to, to look at the, um, the the levels of EVs that have both CD147? Yeah, I know. Um, I, I know that there's been a lot of uh, <laughs> advances in the technology for this. We saw... Many of those are technologies at work that was presented at the ICEF meeting, um, at the ICEF's meetings. Um, unfortunately, uh, yeah, we, um, yeah, we don't have a lot of that instrumentation available. So uh, we had to use um, whatever instrumentation we did have on hand and, 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 you know, modify accordingly. Yes, we are aware there's instrumentation. We just don't have that available or have access on hand. All right. Um, Genevieve or Genevieve, you can uh, unmute yourself and, and uh, ask your question if you have a microphone. Okay. Sorry, I can't start my video because it says the host has stopped it. But oh, that's, anyway. That's um, Thank you very much for this interesting talk. I was actually curious to know whether you have checked if those microRNA are, are luminal or if they are on the surface. So no, I realize that yeah, you know, this is this has been a very um you know really uh, contentious um area of investigation. And one thing that I did uh, not mention uh, during my talk is that for um, 
in preparing our EVs and evaluating the microRNAs, we've always pre-treated our EV preps uh, with RNAs. Okay, thank you. I actually had another question um, about the interactions between um, CD147 and the HNRNP. Yes. Um, do you, uh, I guess, have you looked into what kind of interaction is going on? Like what domain of the proteins are, are interacting and if you are able to disrupt it? Yeah, that's a great question, Zach. Um, it's unclear whether CD147 is directly binding to HNRMP A2B1. And this needs to be further investigated. Now, one possibility is that the interaction between CD147 and HNRMP A2B1 might be indirect and mediated through caviolin 1. And the reason is that uh, there is there are studies which have shown that uh, HNRMP A2B1 is mediating sorting of microRNA into EVs through interacting with caviolin. And there is an earlier study that has shown that caviolin interacts with CD147. So the interaction between CD147 and, 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 and uh, HNRP1 could be mediated through caviolin 1. But we still yet to determine whether this interaction is direct and which domains of those two respective proteins are interacting with one another. But it's a good question. Thank you. Okay, I see we're getting some more questions here. Uh, Artem, you can uh, unmute yourself and ask your question. Uh, thank you, very interesting presentation. Um, I was wondering if uh, you could uh, recommend uh, any uh, technique, uh, how we can uh, separate uh, or disconnect vesicles from antibody. Like well, I was the... actually, it's a great question. Um, I was actually hoping uh, someone in the audience would be able to provide feedback on that because that was a significant challenge. As you can see, we've had to do this inference approach of using a marker negative population, which is untouched. And because this was the first limitation, um, because yes, it is very difficult to detach without uh, affecting the integrity of the EV structure. So I'm very sorry, I'm not able <laughs> to provide um, an answer. I would really hope and really um, appeal to the audience that if you have, uh, can suggest a methodology, um, please share it. Um, okay, Bethany Hannafon has a question about uh, tetraspan and positive release. Yes. Hi, good afternoon. Great presentation, very interesting work. Um, I My question was, since tetraspan and positive EVs have also been reported to contain microRNA, and you see a little bit there, I, I presume, and, and that's been reported by others as well. Have you thought about or have you looked at whether these CD147 positive EVs contain distinct microRNA populations than maybe some of the other tetraspanin positive EVs? Yeah, very good question. And thank you for that. Yes, uh, there are, I'm aware there are some papers that have uh, detected microRNAs in tetraspanin positive EVs. Um, and, and some papers have shown that that content is, 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 very, is very low. Uh, several from several independent groups. However, in regard to differences in the type of microRNAs in each subpopulation, this could be possible. And the reason is that uh, our study shows that you know the CD1 the, the, that the CD147 positive EVs are enriched in microRNA through uh, interacting either directly or indirectly with HNRMP-A2B1. And it has been reported by another group that HNRMP-A2B1 mediates a sorting of microRNAs into EVs through recognizing specific motifs. So it could be possible that 
uh, CD147 positive EVs could be selectively enriched in microRNAs that contain specific motifs, but that's still yet to be fully determined. Thank you. I had one last question, actually. Um, I know I've asked a lot of questions already, but- Oh, that's fine. <laughs> um, You're asking good ones. Yeah, so so if these EVs, these CD147 positive EVs are carrying microRNAs that mm -hmm. appear to be delivered functionally into, into target cells, do you yes. have any ideas about um, the mechanism by which those those microRNAs or microRNA complexes with RNPs are escaping the EVs and ending up in the uh, the cytosol of the target cells? Yeah, uh, that's a very good question. Um, we have not investigated this. Um, it's actually um, it's something that we have uh, you know discussed within the lab in regard to the enormous amount of papers that have shown that EVs are transporting microRNAs in recipient cells. And, and we have been, uh, that was actually what really motivated this study was just the, you know, the just the vast number of studies that have shown this phenomenon. And yet we have these other very compelling studies that have shown that most EVs do not contain biologically significant amounts of microRNA. That's what really motivated us. And 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 part of this um, was that yes, we we're not sure, and we were we were we were puzzled by how once you know the EVs taken out, how do these? And it's not just with microRNA; it's with proteins with a number of cargo. How do they manage to escape? Presumably, you know, the EV is degraded, the contents are released, but how does that cargo go where it's supposed to go? And we actually looked into this in um, a previous uh, EV study by my lab uh, published four years ago in communication biology, where we were really puzzled by you know, some of the earlier EV studies that had shown that, yeah, EVs, um, are especially are containing a lot of growth factors and ligands and were being uh, taken up by a recipient cell, which showed a particular change in behavior. And that change in behavior was attributed to those growth factors. And we were really puzzled by how those growth factors could signal in the recipient cell if they've been taken up, if they're being delivered through EVs. And we actually focused on uh, one of the um, most commonly identified growth factor, VEGF, um, because it had always been assumed that the VEGF is encapsulated in the EVs. And we couldn't figure out how this ligand could signal if it's being delivered intracellularly. Now, there is some evidence of intercrine signaling, but it, it wouldn't explain the rapid response of, say, an endothelial cell if they're taking up VGF delivered in EVs. But we actually found in that case that there is membranous, a membranous form of VGF which is not encapsulated within the EVs but is present on the uh, membrane surface and was signaling competent and it could signal without being taken up by EVs. So I think that, um, you know, we need some flexibility in the dogma that not all um, EV associated molecules are going to be encapsulated. They could be biologically uh, active and associated with the perp with, on the surface. They don't necessarily uh, require cellular uptake to be biologically um, active in the, in the recipient cell, but that would be the case for uh, proteins, but for microRNA, they would definitely need to be taken up to be biologically active. But in answer to your question, Zach, I cannot give you a definitive answer how they would, um, you know, get out of the EVs and find their target, especially in a very efficient manner. It seems to me just generally a relatively inefficient process. Thank you for that great response. 
So it, it doesn't appear that we have any other uh, questions. So again, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Nora for this great talk and uh, thanks everyone for attending and for, for giving great discussion questions. Thank you everybody for your questions and feel free to contact me if you have any you know, additional questions. Thanks so much again. Thank you everyone.